I remember the very first uh, meditation retreat I did in Chiang Mai. Uh, when was it? 1992, I think. And it was the hot season. Uh, and uh, one of the things that happened there was that, unbeknownst to all of the meditators, we were in a in a monastery on the outskirts of Chiang Mai. And while we were there doing our meditation and on our retreat, then there was a revolution happening. We didn't know anything about it, really. All the people of Chiang Mai were on the streets all over Thailand, in Bangkok and so on as well. They called the People's Revolution. And so while we were sitting in our rooms, meditating, trying to be free, there were people out on the streets also trying to be free. And right now we've taken the choice to come here to spend time on retreat, to spend time uh, quietly, to enjoy the peace. But of course, that's not the sum of our life. That's something that we do part of our life. And the world goes on while we're in here. So in the part of the world that I come from today, the skies are gloomy and full of ash. The skies are red. People can smell the fire wherever they are. And they're using words like apocalyptic to describe what it's like. I, I, sh I should mention, I, I, you, you might think I'm, I'm talking about Australia. No, I'm, I'm actually talking about New Zealand. That, you, know, you know New Zealand? Small country, lots of hobbits. Uh, about a thousand kilometers away from Australia. Yeah, that's what it's like in New Zealand now because of the Australian fires. Mm. Uh, in Australia, thousands of people spent the night on beaches. Their, their homes burnt, their villages and towns burnt. And in the daytime, nine o'clock or 10 o'clock in the morning, you'd think that with so much bushfires that there'd be, you know, the smoke would be in the air and it would be dark and gloomy, but it's not actually like that. It's actually pitch black. There's just no light at all. It's like, it's like a, 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 the mid, middle of the night. That's how thick the smoke is. And then the only light that comes is the light that's, that's the, when the fire comes. And this red glare and this red glow across all the ocean. You see these people on their boats trying to escape. They go down to the water's edge and thousands of people, animals all gathered along the beaches and just lying down in the sand by the water as close to the water as they can get because that's the only place that they can actually breathe the air. So we've had a, 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 a evolution of language, the way that we talk about things. We used to talk about climate change and global warming and then global heating and then climate crisis and climate collapse. And now they finally, they, they're, they're people are talking about apocalypse. So we've got now, this is apocalyptic. There's not a lot of, we haven't got a lot, to, there's no really where to go after apocalyptic, right? It doesn't, <laughs> we, have, we haven't got a, we haven't got a word in English that's going to up the ante once you've reached its apocalyptic. So I don't know what we're going to use in the future. When this happens again in two years' time or three years' time or four years' time, somewhere else, what, what word are we going to use? I don't know. In Australia, I guess it'll just become normal. We won't call it an apocalypse anymore. We'll just call it summer weather. So everything that we're doing here is 
not disconnected from everything which is happening outside. And you know, in meditation circles, I have this kind of idioms that people use. They say, they say things like, "Ah, oh, in daily life." Right. So I'm going. How am I going to practice in daily life? I, I, I don't know what other kind of life there is. Actually, is there a life that isn't daily? What are we going to do? How are we going to practice when we're out there in the world? Is is this not part of the world? Is the place that we're in not part of the world? So the world is just the world. Life is just life. Meditation is not something which is outside of the world or apart from it. Meditation is just another condition. It's just another thing that we do while we're in the world. And while we're breathing, we're sitting here doing breathing meditation, then this is one way of being in the world. I'm not trying to say that Buddhism and the Buddhist path is like entirely based in this world. Obviously Buddhism has a transcendental aspect and our path leads beyond to Nibbana, which is not part of this world. But the practice, what we're actually doing here, is very much a part of this world. And when we do breathing meditation, we breathe in oxygen, we breathe out CO2. Every breath that we take is making global warming worse. Congratulations everybody. <laughs> I mean, it's good though. I mean, breath meditation, quieten your breath down. The more you quieten the breath, then the less you're emitting CO2. Yeah? If there was a lot more meditators in the world, then we'd be a lot better off. But even the, the air that we breathe is, is not the same. The air we breathe is full of chemicals, pollutions, uh, a few a little while ago, there was a big crisis about microplastics, and you could see like all of the plastics and so on in the in the ocean and the islands of plastic and things like this. Well, it was apparently, ninety nine percent of the plastic which has been created by humanity has gone missing. Right? If you see all those garbage islands and plastic floating around in the ocean, that's only the one percent. The rest of it we can't see. And so that's all the microplastics and nanoplastics. It's dissolved into all these chemicals and so on. And when you're breathing, that's what you're breathing in. Even if you go to, the, to Tibet, to the Himalayas, you're still breathing it. So what we're doing here is part of all of those things out there. And our choice as spiritual practitioners is not, you know, do we live as part of the world or do we not live as part of the world? Our, our question is, how do we live skillfully? And a life that's lived skillfully is a life that's lived well for what is here and now. It's a life that's lived well for what is the future. And it's a life that's lived well for what is going beyond, for what is transcending all of this. And so from a Buddhist point of view, these are not conflicting things. We don't have to make a choice. Do we practice in the world or do we practice outside of the world or practice for what's outside of the world? Living well in the world is the path to transcending the world. So we come here, we spend a few days meditating. And as we meditate, we uh, develop our practice of mindfulness. On the first day I talked about uh, mindfulness in the sense of being the awareness and the physical awareness of things. Yesterday I talked about uh, contentment. And this morning I want to talk about another quality which is fundamental for developing meditation and that quality in Pali they call Sampajanya. And Sampajanya is closely associated with mindfulness or with sati but is not quite exactly the same. In fact, a lot of times in modern days when people talk about mindfulness, what they really mean is not sati, but sampajanya. So what is sampajanya then? Well, uh, traditionally it's been translated as something like full awareness or uh, clear comprehension or something like that. And these are words that are more or less the kind of Buddhist terms that don't really... Um, 
you know, they don't really have any, any specialized meaning apart from how they're used in the Buddhist texts. A number of years ago when I was doing my translations, I sort of happened to stumble across this word, uh, situational awareness, which is a word that's been used in psychology in increasing times. And situational awareness is a word that has a kind of interesting history. It began uh, with studies of fighter pilots. Uh, and the question was, how come if you have two, fight, two pilots with the same training and the same equipment and they go into a combat, how come one of them comes back and the other one doesn't? What's the, what's the actual deciding factor? And studies of this ended up pointing to a quality which they called situational awareness. And situational awareness essentially means your ability to understand and know the full context of the situation that you're in to be a, and to be able to quickly and meaningfully synthesize that information and put it to use in the right way. And that was the defining feature that made the difference between uh, fighter, originally a fighter pilot, later on soldiers, and then later on they generalized it to uh, you know, more broad, broader contexts. And when I read about this, it struck me that this is actually very similar to what the Buddha was talking about when he was talking about Sampajanya. Obviously not talking about going into battle, right? But the same mental qualities or similar mental qualities, that, I, that ability to understand what is that context, what's going on all around us, and to, to know, not, 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 just to, to be, not just to have like a bare awareness of that, of that context, but to actually understand it and to comprehend it so that you can meaningfully function within that context. Uh, and so this is a, a story that I've told many times, but I will tell it once more, and I apologize if you've heard it before. Uh, again, remembering my, my first retreat, at the end of my first retreat, I, I uh, was asked, along with a few of the other yogis, to do a bit of help out in the monastery a little bit. And they had demolished a small little wooden hut at one end of the monastery, and they wanted us to just help out by carrying the building materials to the other end of the monastery. It was just a small little job, wasn't any big deal. But for me it was a big deal because it was the first time since I'd done my first meditation retreat that I had actually done any work. I might not just be meditating for a month. And you know, it's easy enough to fool yourself when you're meditating that you can become mindful. Well, I don't know if it's easy enough, but at least it's possible. Well, I don't know if it's possible, at least you can imagine that it might be possible to fool yourself that you've become mindful. But then when you come out of the meditation and you try to do something, okay, I said, this is my challenge. I'm going to just keep my mindfulness and I'm going to be as mindful as possible during the whole time that we're doing this building work. So we went to the building site. And, of course, being Thailand, uh, then you know you don't have anything like safety or anything like that uh, so we're just wearing like uh, rubber flip-flops and first standing outside the building site and I'm looking at the building site okay we've got to pick up these pieces of wood and I thought okay be mindful mindfully aware of my feet rising mindfully aware of my feet moving mindfully aware of my feet going down mindfully aware of my feet stepping on a nail <laughs> it was like literally the first step yeah, that I did. Look, I was perfectly mindful. I knew where my foot was the whole time, right? It just happened to be on top of a nail, that's all, right? So once the uh, nail actually stuck into my foot, however, I rapidly lost mindfulness. <laughs> that's another story. Uh, Yeah, so these are the things that test how strong your mindfulness really are. Yeah. I was just thinking of another, another moment when I also lost mindfulness, when I, I came back from my uh, arms run. I was living in Malaysia at the time, and I came back. For, I used to take my bowl and go to the local market for arms, and then come back. And this one time I came back, I had my robe on, and we were under these cliffs. And... My robe was sort of bunched up a little bit on my shoulder, and I just felt or knew this felt this ant crawl inside my ear. 
Right? The first thing I do, it wasn't like crawling around on me or anything like that. The first thing I knew, this thing was crawling inside my ear. And it was one of those big red biting ants. Mm. Yeah, and it crawled inside my ear and started eating my brain. <laughs> yeah, that was not conducive to retaining mindfulness. <laughs> I went over, there was a coffee shop noodle house nearby, so I went over there. I didn't speak any Chinese and they didn't speak any English. And I'm like pointing to my ear and... Ow! Ow! <laughs> Help! <laughs> yeah. They took, eventually they took me to the doctor. I'm like, they go, oh, yeah, please wait in the queue. And there's all these people like waiting to get their forms filled out and things like that. I'm like, this, this creature is eating my brain. I don't want to wait in the queue. No, it says, yes, 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 just wait. Yes. <laughs> by, the time I get, by the time I get into the doctor, he points his light in there. His first words were, oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway. Did he come out alive? Uh, no. No, the ant did not make it alive, unfortunately. There were considerable efforts to try to get the ant out, and during which time the ant was killed. But they had to, uh, yeah, had to then leave it for the inflammation to die down before they could extract it. Anyway, what was I talking about? Oh yes, mindfulness, right. So this was a lesson for me. Well, how come that I was being perfectly mindful and yet I obviously did something so stupid? Right? It's because I had sati and mindfulness, but I didn't have sampajanya, yeah, situational awareness. Right? So I didn't have awareness. Like if I had proper situational awareness, A, I would have got a pair of boots to start with, if I could, or at least a decent pair of shoes or something. And B, I would have being more mindful of like checking the, my surroundings and aware of what I was doing and the context and all of these kinds of things. But I had this very narrow mindfulness that was very focused on that particular situation. And see, the thing is that that had been a great retreat and I'd done, you know, done a lot of meditation and had some really good experiences. It was really a transformational retreat. It's not as if the mindfulness that I had was wrong, right? It was just somehow incomplete. And this is something that I notice a lot with people who, um, who, who's, whose practice is very narrowly focused on meditation retreats. And we had that experience at, at Santi Monastery a number of times when I was staying there. One of the things that we did was that we were a bit of a, a refuge for, uh, for monks and nuns, uh, especially coming back from Burma, because a lot of times the monks and nuns would go to Burma and meditate a lot, but then their health might not be very good or something else. And so... A number of them over the years came back and stayed with us. And I remember one monk in particular, and he'd been in Burma as a monk for like you know six months or a year or something, not a, not a huge amount of time, but long enough. And sort of when he came back, he didn't know anything about being a monk. It was so weird. He'd just been in this meditation center the whole time, walking and sitting, and he came back and he like knew nothing about veneer or anything about being a monk. And... Yet he had to come back for, I don't know what it was, health reasons or something like that. And he just didn't know how to do anything. So this is, can be this very, very narrow way of practicing where we think that, oh, this, 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 what I'm doing on my meditation cushion, this is the only thing that matters. And this is what my practice is. But this is just part of the context. The, the path is eightfold. Meditation is really just the last two or three of those factors. Yeah. There's many other things to, to spiritual practice as well. And if our mindfulness is too narrowly focused, then it will become very brittle. It's tempting. It's tempting to do that because you can go very fast, very quickly. Right? You can just focus just on one thing and then your mind can go deep and you can have all these great experiences and things like that. It feels very transformational, but it tends to be kind of a like a blip like that. You do that, whoo and then whoo, come off retreat, <laughs> and you're back where you started from. And then you're like, oh, well, maybe next retreat. Yeah, that'll be good. Boom. And you can do that for a long time, and you're not necessarily going to see any particular progress, right? because what you're doing is not balanced. It's not, it doesn't have a broad basis. So practicing with sampajanya is one of the ways it helps us give us a broader basis. Yeah? Uh, 
and you know you can see you can see that in, in in little things that people do. Just some examples that happen when I'm when I'm teaching dhamma. One of the things that I notice is that when when I'm teaching dhamma is that that people when they people come in uh, late, they'll sit by the door, and then the next person comes in late and they sit next to them, and then the door gets crowded, <laughs> right, and. This happens like week after week, and nobody thinks, well, actually, you know, I'll go to the other side of the room. You know, don't actually sit next to a doorway. This is kind of basic awareness of space. So this is part of what Sampajanya means, is being aware of the space around you. How is the space being used? What is that space for? Right? And, you know, since this is, this is one of the reasons why I let you arrange your own meditation cushions, Right, is to get some idea of how that space is being used. Uh, uh, being, being conscious of time and context. Right? So here on our retreat, then we're keeping silent. And so it's appropriate, you've all agreed to keep silence for the retreat, and so it's appropriate to respect that, to respect yourself by keeping silence, but also to respect all the other practitioners. Right? And to respect me, I went through that whole process with you of let's figure out how we're going to keep silence, right? So don't mess me around, all right? <laughs> you made that pledge, do it. Respect the people around you. Respect the retreat, respect the Dhamma. This also is part of that Sampajanya. It doesn't mean that talking is bad or wrong. It means that there's a context. And here, this context is what we're doing. Sampajanya also pertains to uh, when we're eating our food and being mindful about what you're eating. It also means when you're going to the bathroom and going to the toilet. And one of the glorious things about the Satipatthana Sutta, you know, and you can, can only imagine what the English people thought when they went to Sri Lanka and they're like, oh, this is very s f sacred scripture that is like you know, so revered by people and is like on people's shrines and worshipped everywhere, what does it actually say? And then somebody says, yes, 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 you should be mindful when you're going to the toilet. What? <laughs> what, kind of, what kind of sacred scripture is that? As I'm not, I may well be wrong, so please correct me, but as far as I know, Buddhism's the only religion that I've found that actually teaches you about the spiritual practice of doing a poo. Right? And your mindfulness is not something that stops on the meditation cushion. And your spiritual practice is not something that just belongs in a temple or in a retreat center. It's your life. And it's your life in here and your life outside of there. And your spiritual practice is just as important on the days after your retreat and before the retreat as it is during the retreat. Don't think that somehow here on the retreat you're going to make all these big progress and that that's going to then you know, catapult you into the future. Right? It doesn't work like that. Here we have a particular mode of practice which enables us to do certain kinds of things that's not so easy to do in our ordinary life. That's why we come here. And particularly we can focus on mindfulness, we can focus on silence, we can focus on meditation and all of those things. But in terms of its actual spiritual significance for your growth as a human being, an ordinary Wednesday that you spend at work is just as important as a day that you spend here on retreat. And your mindfulness, or lack thereof, your situational awareness, or lack thereof, your wisdom, or lack thereof, your precepts, or lack thereof, are going to impact you just as much on an ordinary Wednesday as they do when you're here on retreat. Yeah. So again, this is Sampajanya, understanding the context of your body, the time, the situation, your life, and understanding the context that within all of this and within everything that we're doing here, everything that we're doing takes part within the Dhamma. And that means that all of it ultimately comes back to the idea that the suffering in the world is something that we create from inside ourselves and that we can overcome from inside ourselves. So we take responsibility for 
not necessarily the situation that we find ourselves in, but we take responsibility for the way that we respond to that situation. And that's something that's not just about knowing what's going on, but it's about having some courage as well. Many of my, you know, when I'm thinking about the tragedies that my, my countrymen in Australia are having, going through at the moment, I'm, I'm, I'm also thinking about, because like, for, for Australians, for most Australians, we've, we're very, we, we call ourselves the lucky country, and we've, most of us have had a very comfortable life. But many of my friends in Australia are from refugee communities, or from play, they've come from backgrounds where they haven't had a comfortable life. Many of them, for example, come from Vietnam, where they suffered persecution under the communist government, fled uh, as refugees and came to Australia with nothing. And th their stories are, are incredible. One of the monks that I know, Venerable Thich Phuong Ba, uh, had to leave Vietnam uh, because of government persecution. He ended up in a, uh, uh, as a refugee in a camp in Malaysia. And when he was in that camp, he started looking after the people there. And there's something very p profound in that. He's just a guy, like he's a friend of mine, and he's now he's a very senior monk. But, you know, in those days he would have been a young monk, torn away from his country, torn away from his family. Sure, he's put on robes and he has his Dhamma practice, but that doesn't magically transform you into some mystical being that isn't human anymore, right? He's still a human being and he's a refugee. And yet when he's there in that camp, he found it in himself to start ministering and helping and supporting those who are around him. That was his sampajanya, his way of practicing in that particular time and place. We don't know what the future will hold for us. We don't know where we are going to end up. And often we end up in situations that are quite unexpected. Another story the same monk told me with the monastery he was in in Vietnam before he left. He said that uh, one day, one of the monks who'd been there for a number of years went to the abbot of that monastery, bowed to the abbot of the monastery and burst out in tears. And the abbot said to him, what are you, what are you crying for? He said, what's, what's your problem? And the monk said, he said, I just have to confess, I'm not a proper monk. And the abbot says, what do you mean? He said, actually, I'm, I'm a government spy. The Communist Party put me here in this monastery because they wanted to observe the subversives. And this happens in monasteries all over uh, Vietnam, China, and places like this. It's a normal way of doing business. Everybody knows it. And this poor fellow was crying. And he's saying, you know, I've been here for so many years, and I have to g I've been giving my reports back to the government every month, telling them what's going on. And he said, my whole time here, I've never seen anyone do anything bad. All I've seen is people acting out of kindness, people studying the Dhamma and practicing the Dhamma, and doing their best to help everybody around them. And I feel so full of shame that, that I've been here and treating you in this way. And he said, after all this time, all I want to do is be a monk. I don't want to be a spy anymore. I just want to be a monk. But I can't. Because in the Vinaya, if you become a monk by being an imposter, then you can't ordain. So these are the situations we get ourselves into. These are the, 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 the turns that life takes. We think we're in, living in one world, and it turns out, we turn around, actually we're living in another world. We think that something is important, and then we turn around, like the people in Australia waking up today. You imagine that, imagine your town, all of the things in there, the things that you thought were important, the local shop, the local restaurant, your house, your friend's place, all the places that have those memories. You thought that those things were so important, they make up your life, and you wake up this morning and they're, they're just not there anymore. So this is our Sampajanya. Our Sampajanya understands our context. It understands that we here are lucky enough and privileged enough to have this time and this space. It's not something we can take for granted. If you listen, eh? see, this is when people talk about impermanence. But impermanence, see, these teachings in Buddhism, they become like, they become so worn. 
they become so repeated that that they lose they lose their meaning, they lose their spark, they lose their life. But if you listen, listen to the moment, listen to the present, to what's happening, then you can hear impermanence in every moment. And you can hear this uncertainty. You can hear this emptiness. It's like this reality which is pressing in upon us. When you become quiet and peaceful in your meditation, you start to open up to that reality. Right? Normally, normally our mind is, is trapped in its thoughts and in its concepts and its ideas and its memories and its perceptions and it uses all of these things to construct this world which is safe and known and repeatable and predictable. And there's always a tension around that because we know that just outside that world there's something which is unknown and irregular and unpredictable and chaotic. And so we hold on to what we know to try to keep ourselves safe. And that's a coping mechanism. Now, coping mechanisms are good, right? <laughs> coping is better than not coping, yeah? But that's all it is. It's just coping. It's not understanding. It's not comprehension. And it certainly isn't freedom. So when we learn to meditate, we learn to open up that cage little bit by little bit. And we can let the reality in. We don't necessarily do it all at once. If you do it all at once, it would be too much. You have to do it little bit by little bit. And those insights come to you. And that, that bleeding edge of impermanence and uncertainty gradually, gradually, gradually becomes aware. You become aware of it. You become sensitive to it. And so this is, this is that, where that sampajanya, that contextual awareness, is deepening and turning into wisdom. So in its, in its ordinary sense, sampajanya is like a, a preliminary, like a basic form of wisdom. It's an ordinary kind of wisdom, wisdom that might be also shared by a, a soldier in a battlefield or by a meditator. But as we, as we go on, Gradually, 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 that becomes deeper. And we realize that our context is not just this room, this person, but it's this life, it's this world, it's this reality, it's this existence. So on this retreat, our main emphasis is on finding that peace within us, finding that stillness within us. If you can find that place, no, let me rephrase, when you find that place, <laughs> positive reinforcement, <laughs> when, <laughs> when you find that place, yeah, then that's a revelation. The first time you find that place of real peace inside yourself, it's a revelation. It tells you something critically important, that you carry peace and happiness inside yourself. And what ha what's happening outside doesn't need to determine that. You can find peace wherever you are because it's something that happens within inside yourself. So as our, our journey on this retreat is to go into that place as deeply as possible. But don't let that become too brittle. Don't let it become don't 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 erect walls around your peace. There's a there's a beautiful phrase in Pali for this. Uh, it's a long phrase, I can't know if I can remember it. Sasankara nigaiha, something, something, something. Uh, basically it means that there's a kind of a, a, a samadhi or a stillness or a peace of mind that is forcibly held in place by restraints. Right? It's as if you have to sort of lash your mind up and tie it up and hold it still. Yeah? And that's a kind of peace which you can get in a meditation, in a meditation retreat, especially if you have a set of conditions that are very conducive. But it's not real samadhi. I mean, it's okay, right? It's, you know, it's not bad. At least there's some peace of mind there. But it's very brittle. And with the, fir with the first smallest thing, it'll fall apart. So what we want is something that's going to be much more resilient. Ask yourself, I can be peaceful here to this degree, 
Right? What if I was on that beach in Australia? Would I be able to be peaceful there? Would I be able to be peaceful with all the people that I've known in my life, all of them homeless, with the little children trying to lie down on the beach so they can breathe, with the animals coming out, trying to find something, with people getting on boats and trying to go off into the ocean to escape the fires? Could I be in that situation and be at peace? I, I couldn't, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> I'd be freaking out, right? But there's a challenge there. There's something, there's something meaningful there. If our peace of mind is so dependent on these conditions, then how, how genuine is it? How, how, how meaningful is it for our long-term spiritual development? So, again, this question that so many people ask me, how do you integrate these things? Like you come here, you do this meditation, how do you integrate what you're doing on with the meditation with what you're doing on outside the meditation? This is how you do it, through Sampajanya. And you don't, you don't begin when you go home, you begin now. You begin by understanding that when you get up from your seat and walk to the door and walk out the corridor, that's just as, much, that's just as important for your spiritual development as what you do in your meditation. When you walk across the grass, when you go to eat your meal, when you go to have a rest, when you go to have a shower, all of these things are just as important for your spiritual progress as your meditation is. So bring your awareness, bring your sampajanya to all of those things. Understand them, understand their context. And you see how these things start to fit into a pattern. And when you see how they fit into a pattern, then you stop seeing the outside world as being something that's threatening your peace of mind. We don't get peace of mind despite the outside world. We get peace of mind because of the outside world. We wouldn't be able to be here if it wasn't for all the things people were doing in the outside world. So don't see these things as being antagonistic. Okay, that's enough for this morning. I will leave you with that. And uh, uh, see you at lunchtime.